Thank you, uh, Madhush and, and, and Richard, for, for setting this up. Um, my father gave a talk here in Canterbury 25 years ago, and it was the highlight of his academic career, so it's really kind of exciting for me to travel in his footsteps uh, Who is that? a little bit. Hmm? Who was that? Oh, he's not an economist. He was talking over in the College of Education, probably. Um, but he never stopped talking about his visit. Um, as Mara says, I'm a, a law professor. To the extent that I'm an economist, it's because uh, I've been studying for the last couple of years um, the market behavior of things as their legal status, their legal status changes, and in particular, uh, looking at uh, copyrights and uh, and patents and studying what happens when they fall into the public domain, when their legal status changes from protected property to uh, public domain uh, input that anybody uh, can use, and we will eventually, at the end of this presentation, get to my current empirical research, which involves a, a human subject experiment involving uh, audio books. But I, I thought I'd start out just sort of charting um, why uh, this has become an important uh, area of, of study around the world and the kind of work that's been done so far, much of which uh, Richard has uh, seen already, so I'll have to uh, bear, bear with me a little bit here. Uh, what gives salience to any empirical research right now having to do with copyright is the fact that we have uh, you know, content providers circling the world trying to convince legislatures to extend the term of protection uh, for existing works, uh, typically in 20-year chunks. Uh, the U.S. Congress did this in 1998. England and Japan, who pay more attention to what their academics tell them before they pass laws, have resisted uh, uh, retroactive extensions, as have other countries around, uh, around the world. And what's interesting about the uh, debate is that incentives to create are not the issue. The debate is over existing works, and they already exist. We don't need to create new incentives for uh, uh, works to come into existence that are already there. So the debate really turns on whether uh, bad things happen when works fall into the public domain. So we have uh, several economists who have made arguments that uh, copyrighted works need to retain their status as property. Uh, they need owners because bad things will happen. And these bad things come in three sorts of flavors. Uh, the first argument is that uh, you know, without an owner, a copyrighted work will become uh, an orphan. It will no longer be exploited in the market. We'll see less availability, less dis distribution, less uh, exploitation. Uh, the second fear is exactly the opposite. <laughs> if the work falls into the public domain, uh, it will be overused. Tragedy of the common sort of argument you're all familiar with. Uh, the third fear uh, is the one really that the audiobooks study is trying to get at, and that is not so much that a work will be uh, overexploited, but rather the type of exploitation will diminish the value of the underlying work and will be dis uh, debased uh, because it's been misused as opposed to overused. Uh, and people take uh, all of these arguments fairly seriously, even though they might seem uh, counterintuitive. At least they do sometimes to me. Uh, Congress expressly uh, accepted the argument made by Landis and Posner that, um, you know, in the absence of protection, copyright protection, uh, we're going to have uh, inefficiencies because of impaired incentives to invest and maintain and exploit these works. So the property needs an owner in order to be efficiently exploited, uh, and Congress thought that was a perfectly good reason to extend protection uh, 20 years to all sorts of works in the United States, starting in 1998. Uh, the, the overgrazing argument, like I said, is basically just a tra tragedy of commons argument. Landis and Posner put it in exactly those terms. What's the difference between a pool of oil or gas and a, and a copyrighted work? If anybody can drill or anybody can exploit it, it will be overused and its value will be depleted too quickly. Um, I love this, you know, this third argument, uh, which is sort of the hardest to empirically get a handle on, and that is that uh, a work uh, can be uh, uh, misused and debased in such a way that its underlying value is impaired. And uh, the debates here almost always turns on the pornographic use of works. If Mickey Mouse falls in the public domain. We're going to have porn Mickey Mouse movies, and Mickey Mouse loses value. And uh, that's something well, we should all like highly consider. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. It may enhance. I agree completely. I agree completely. <laughs> that's exactly right. Thank you. Um, so now all three of these fears, of course, they're, they're empirical assertions, right? They're purely empirical assertions. They can uh, be tested. 
and a number of us uh, over the last uh, six, seven years have been trying to test all three of these assertions. One of the first was a, a guy named Brooks, uh, who was hired by the Library of Congress to look at um, several thousand popular recordings uh, from 1890 to 1964. And what he, he was interested in is who's converting these old vinyl recordings or these old cylindrical recordings into a digital format, which is clearly a good thing as far as the public is concerned and as far as the maintaining the availability of these classic uh, uh, recordings are concerned. He found out that copyright owners had only converted 14% of these recordings uh, into digital format uh, but non-owners had, con had uh, converted 22% to uh, a digital format, suggesting that a work doesn't need an owner uh, in, order to, uh, in order to be uh, made more available to the public, at least in this particular form and this particular kind of work. Um, I did a study four years ago now on best-selling books, uh, looking it's particularly nice to do research about U.S. copyright because Everything before 1923 is in the public domain. Everything after 1923, for the most part, is still protected by copyright. You don't have to worry about life of the author when you're looking at works during this period. So it makes it really easy to sort of collect your data. So collected, you know, the 171 bestsellers from the 10-year period, 1913 to 22, uh, all of which have now fallen into the public domain, and uh, took a look at 173 bestsellers from the following 10-year period, all of which are still protected by copyright. And what we did uh, was look at uh, whether the book is, is in print at five-year intervals, how many editions are there, um, to get a feel for you know what happens to these works when they fall in the public domain. Do they suddenly drop out of, out of sight or not? Um, what's interesting is up until the year 2000, so if you do your statistical analysis from 1988, when uh, the works from 1913 fell into the public domain, to 2000, um, what we're, what we're doing here is we're looking at the percent of works that are uh, in print at any particular point in time. So around 2000, you have uh, uh, of the copyrighted books, about 69% are in print, uh, about 60% of the public domain books are in print. Over the previous years, they've crossed back and forth. So no statistical significance, uh, statistically significant difference in terms of availability uh, up until the year 2000. After 2000, there's uh, books from the public domain are statistically significantly more likely to be in print, reaching almost 100% uh, status by the year 2006, whereas um, only 72% at that point in time of the copyrighted books are, are in print. Yeah, please jump in. I okay, so the, yeah. This is restricted to that infinitesimal subset of the bestsellers, right? Yeah. Because if you look at all books in print, uh, those you'd be you know, somewhere Okay. It's about three, two or three percent. <laughs> it's really, it's really okay. I just wonder, like, that's yeah. a, it's a really interesting graph, conditional information to have. But if you went down another notch of a thousand, I mean, I don't know whether it's easy enough to do, but that would be yeah. quite interesting. Yeah, they, right. And they, these these lines would converge, and they would they would drop the greater percentage of actual books you get. The reason why we just look at bestsellers, and this is interesting, even land is imposed, even the hardcore property people don't think that books that don't have any current value should be protected by copyright. So the debate is entirely about what we should do with the most popular books, works that have held their value over time. Because there's no debate over the 95% of works from this particular era that no longer have any, any market value at all. Everybody says they should, anybody who wants to exploit them can. There's nothing. Except Congress. Hmm? Except Congress, right. <laughs> who, for, who prefers to legislate uh, in, in strokes. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. What happens in 2000, we just speculate. Um, my, my thought is that this is about the time when scanning technology and uh, software for reformatting books becomes really cheap and affordable. So it becomes much easier to grab a public domain book off the library shelves uh, for a publisher to do that and convert it into a, into a nice looking um, and product. Too. Uh, Amazon too, that becomes a market. That's exactly what it becomes a market uh, that, that exists before. Yeah. It just, I mean, you're happy with us jumping in. Just, no, it, please, please. I, again, the, the selection of the, the, the data is, it, is interesting um, because they're easily available to the things. But I'm aware of, uh, so for example, the Broadcasting Corporation in New Zealand has vinyl recordings made from World War II mm -hmm. of soldiers who were overseas. And, uh, I mean, as it, as it happened, my, my partner's dad, before he died the last 10 years of his life, 
spit converted into books uh, from vinyl into some sort of digital format. So they've got, not that they're not published at any rate, but there was an internal mechanism uh, which was happening with this stuff that otherwise just wasn't available. And you wonder, I mean, when it, how much that goes on, how much it doesn't go on, that would be archive, really interesting archival material. What, what causes the large fluctuation in the percentage as you go along? You know, you've got variations between 30%, 40%, and 70% mm -hmm. in relatively short spans of time. Um, yeah, but books go in and out of print um, fairly frequently. So you'll find something that's in print in 1930. I'm sorry, you'll find something that's in print in 1988 that isn't in print in 1989 and it's back in print. Um, so you have you know, quite a bit of fluctuation just in, uh, among publishers as to what you know they keep in their warehouse in any particular. You might have thought some of these things are compensating. So book A is in print this year, book B is not, and then next year it flips over, which means the percentage would stay the same. That seems mm -hmm. interesting that it varies by so much. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, that's a good point. So how, how do you define exactly to be published? This has to be a, a legitimate commercial publisher. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is a this is listed in books in print, this sort of standard American publication. So uh, there's no e-books in here, there's, there's no... Uh, um, uh, so library new hasn't existed. Self-publishing or anything, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the, you know, other conclusions, the public domain books are, are in twice as many editions by twice as many publishers. So this, this prior thing is, is it in, in print uh, at all? Uh, if you count the number of publishers, that are publishing the book, you end up seeing twice as many uh, editions by twice as many publishers. Uh, interestingly, if you look at the at, if you look at the overall uh, group, the average price is exactly the same for the public domain and the copyrighted books, which kind of surprised me because if you're of course you're publishing a public domain book, you don't have to pay anybody a royalty, so I expected the price to be lower. If you look at just the most popular titles, though, you do see a, a price differential. So we broke out the top 20 most popular books from each of these two eras, and if look at just the top 20, um, then the uh, public domain books are significantly uh, cheaper. This is brand new. Even Richard hasn't seen this. Uh, this is super exciting, interesting preliminary data, I think. I had one of my students write a computer program that would crawl through Amazon.com and pull uh, 2,500 um, fiction uh, titles at random. And this is an interesting program. You can generate a ran random ISBN numbers and then fed 2,000 random ISBN numbers at a time through Amazon, uh, and then collected. Anyway, so the findings are absolutely fascinating. So we, we broke uh, these out by decade. I can't, you can't tell if you can see it, but uh, you would expect, right, that if you crawl through Amazon looking at only new books, and only books sold by Amazon, so these are not used books, these are not sold by Amazon Associates. This is what's in Amazon's warehouse. Of course, you know the, the biggest number of books is from the year, from the decade 2000 to 2010. That's what you'd expect. The more recent, the more popular. Drops off really quickly for books in the 1990s, 1980s, 1970s, 60s, 1950, 1940, 1930. Here's the point in time where books start falling into the public domain. Suddenly, it goes up and up and up. There's as many books Amazon is selling brand new right now from the 1900s to 1910 as from 20,000 to. You go all the way back to you know 1850, right? 1850. There's twice as many books from the 1850s being sold on Amazon right now than the 1950s. So it just sort of confirms this this notion that some sort of positive public domain effect that in fact a, a work is is statistically more likely to be available and to be published um, once it falls into the public domain. And I haven't adjusted this chart yet for for number, and I think it's going to be even more distorted for the number of books published in each of those years, because I have a strong suspicion that fewer <laughs> books were published in 1850 than 1950, right? So uh, I, uh, this is, uh, we're doing this both at Amazon and uh, Barnes and Nobles, which is a standalone bookstore. And, uh, Amazon's API lets you run 2,000? Yeah. yeah. Wow, okay. <laughs> yes, it does. And you only get, actually, I think you ran it, you ran it a 1,000, you can run 1,000 per hour. So you ran 1,000 per hour, 1,000 random ISBN numbers, and it, with the, with the fiction browse node, you come up with only 20 titles, but you get about a 2% hit rate. Um, so this program ran for about a week, basically. <laughs> and he's rewriting, he's rerunning it for me because, unfortunately, uh, because of the way the the way you had to, the way we queried the, through the API, 
um, we got a bunch of um, literary criticism in here too. So this is not purely novels. It's like 80% novels and 20% literary criticism. I don't know whether that undoubtedly like ruins our results or something. We're redoing it for that. Um, second study it involved uh, popular musical compositions from exactly the same era using the same sort of strategy. Unfortunately, there's nothing. There's no way you can track music, whether it's in print or not. There's no equivalent of books in print for music. Uh, so we use a proxy for uh, uh, present availability, and that is uh, appearance in movies, which you can check by going through imdb.com. So we identify um, uh, the results are the same whether you look at songs that appear in one one movie. Uh, between we looked at between 1968 and 2008, choosing that because 1988 is the middle, which is when songs started to fall into the public domain. So we tracked them during that 40-year period. We looked primarily at songs that appeared in at least four movies, these being the most popular, and therefore the, the ones that uh, are you know, really subject to this worldwide debate. But the results hold for whether it's a movie that appears, a song that appears in just one movie or this period of time, or two or three. Uh, I actually have sound bites I can play for this, but I won't, I won't do it. So the public domain song, probably Danny Boy, probably the most famous from, from this era, um, Alexander's Ragtime Man. Uh, the songs from the subsequent era, from 23 to, to 1932, are way more popular. This is prime uh, American Tin Pan Alley. It's Cole Porter. It's the Gershwins. It's, it's spectacularly popular music. So there's more actual songs from the later era that, that we end up studying. But we have enough enough data from public domain songs uh, to show that while they're still protected by copyright, uh, they appear in, uh, uh, these songs appear in uh, a movie about once every 13 years. Once they fall in the public domain, they appear in a movie of once every uh, about four years. So you have a tremendous increase in movie appearances once they fall in the public domain. But, um, you know, we suspect that the IMDb, IMDb database has way more data on more recent movies. So we we're thinking it's, it's entirely possible this went up just because uh, IMDb has more recent movies than it has, you know, older movies. So we wanted to compare, take, take a look at what happens to the copyrighted songs over the same over the same time period, and you have a, an increase of about two and a half uh, while looking at the copyright songs from parallel periods of parallel periods of time. Um, and, uh, you know, we, uh, the, or the stats person tells us, unfortunately, even though it looks like the public domain songs, that there's more of an increase over the same period of time that, uh, because of uh, time being uh, a confounding variable, that the most we can say is that there's no negative public domain effect, that the public domain songs behave the same way. Um, as the copyrighted songs. We can't, as with books, say there's this positive public domain effect. Clearly, they're even more available. I thought we might be able to get a great question when we uh, presented this at the University of Chicago, and somebody said, you know, what if all these public domain movies, uh, uh, songs, appear in these art movies that nobody ever sees? You know, and the copyrighted songs are in Titanic. You know, how can you say the public domain songs are still as available? So we went and got the box office, the gross box office data for all of the movies, and we uh, uh, adjusted it all year by year for what the average ticket price was, and you end up with the same result. There's no statistically significant. And I understood it right that there are some songs from a particular year that are copyrighted, some that aren't. Uh, no, no. Okay. If it's Does it matter then whether the historical setting of the movies changes over time? So say that the more recently, we've had more movies say about the American Prohibition era, and before that, maybe the World War One movies that were popular and you want to be authentic. And yeah, I think there might be. Well, we call this maybe a nostalgia effect. You know, maybe that both both charts go up over time because there's a, a change in the uh, you know common subject matter for movies or something like that. Um, we didn't, however, we don't have a. Uh, yeah, we didn't. Uh, the year, the year in which the movies were set. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we didn't uh, code for uh, subject matter movie yet. All right, so the, the, what we've gone through so far indicates that it, you know there doesn't seem to be any extant empirical data suggesting that under exploitation is a problem. Uh, it seems like these works are either exploited exploited at the same rate or at a higher rate once they fall into the public domain. So 
we go to the second question is whether lack of ownership causes overuse. We couldn't really do that with books. We couldn't think of a way uh, uh, to do it. Um, but you have a chance with uh, music and movies to, to answer the question because you can look at the raw, in raw terms, the rate that copyright owners license their composition. They're comfortable with their songs appearing in movies once every 3.3 years. Public domain compositions are used once every 3.8 years. So it doesn't look like there's much evidence for overuse when they're not used as much when they fall into the public domain. Um, so if you look at the songs as a group, there's no evidence of, of over-exploitation, over-grazing. We looked at individual songs and couldn't find any either. So the most exploited public domain song for Danny Boy and After You're Gone appeared in about one movie every year for a, a decade-long period. But if you look at the copyrighted songs, especially in the 30s, you get uh, songs like Happy Days Are Here again in 34 different movies in one decade. And copyright owner perfectly happy to see that happen. And even more recently, uh, one, one song per movie per year seems to be happily tolerated by copyright owners. We also went and looked at the, the ASCAP license uh, agreement, right? So if you're an owner of composition, you have this, you have an agreement with, with ASCAP. There's no restriction in there whatsoever, either in the owner agreement with ASCAP or the ASCAP agreement with radio stations as to how frequently songs could be played. So if, you, if your radio station wants to play the same song all day long, you know, and wear it out, you know, overgraze it, uh, <laughs> that's fine. I mean, the copyright owner seems to uh, they seem to have no interest in contractually restricting you from doing that. Um, right, yeah, you're paying people to play, to play your song. Or, again, a lot of, I think lay people's intuition here is actually tends to be more spot on than some of the rather tortured economic arguments suggesting that there might be overgrazing somehow. I was, okay. I was yeah. of the, uh, I, I think we've read of something somewhere from a law, a law scholar that the most uh, used copyrighted song was Happy Birthday to You. And isn't that in lots of movies? Uh, yes. And the, I'm trying to think why it doesn't show up uh, in our... It's not It's not a song in our database. And it's the way we got these songs is it's... Oh, I know you why. It's... it's uh, they come from Variety, variety the trade magazine publishes them most uh, popular songs every year. It actually, has to actually go back into the 19th century. And it must not have shown up. It's probably not a recording, a sound recording. In yeah. the we're, we're dealing with compositions, right? So yeah. not with sound recordings. It's good. So I, it may never have in a single year sold enough copies. It, and it's so simple. It may have caused some good people didn't buy copies of it, right? Mm -hmm. So it may have been incredibly popular, but yeah, anyway, it's not on our database, but you're right, I would suspect. And actually, if somebody's got the computer, you can go to IMDb and see how many times it shows up in movies, yeah. Would it be because it's not part of the movie soundtrack as such? It appears in the movie because the characters might sing it, but it's not part of the movie soundtrack like the other songs yeah, that, that shows up on IMDb. That shows up on IMDb, even if it's not, um, even if it's just characters singing it. Uh, and we, we did a couple of checks. So in uh, Jaws, I don't know if you remember when Robert Shaw is sort of drunkenly singing, the law of the silvery moon. Um, that shows up on IMDb as the <laughs> lightning of silvery moon shows up uh, in, uh, in uh, IMDb as, as part of the soundtrack. So, yeah, I, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, IMDb is crazy. I mean, it's, a lot of it's volunteer input uh, still, and it's the level of detail is really impressive. When you of use, um, I mean, when I, the, the, the idea of overuse mind-boggling to me, but I'm thinking of um, schools, primary schools, high schools, every high school around the world, that I've, I've put it this way in, in the world that I've been in, uh, every year puts on one, two, three, four. They, I, I have no idea whether they do this with permission, without permission, or if anybody cares or any worries, but uh, that's got to be a lot of use. It doesn't show up in the IDE. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not necessarily, I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how you get treated as basing or overgrazing or. Um. Yeah, I mean the theory. The, it, it's hard to ever see this with books. The the only the example which might have a little bit of traction is you know a song that we hear. 
first of all, that, that we can't control whether we hear it or not. So something that's in the back, in, in, the background of commercials on the radio or the background of commercials on TV that we just have heard so much, you know, we're sick of it. So and maybe. How is getting there TV shows? Yeah, at least in the States, it might be, you know, the, the famous chorus in Carmina Burana is in like beer commercials and band aid commercials and, and, and the, the, the um, um, Gershwin American Paris thing at Delta 8 Airlines is absolutely played to death. Uh, it made a lot of people sick. The thing is, both of those are still protected by copyright, though. So, you know, all of this is done with the permission of the owner. It seems to me that, that, that overgrazing really can only happen when the, the person encountering the work doesn't have any choice as to whether they encounter it or not. And um, there also has to be, um, you know, there's a price you pay when you irritate the public, right? I mean, it's, it seems to me this overgrazing argument is about the public being so irritated with the work that they don't want to hear it or experience it anymore. And businesses, commercial enterprises, don't have a lot of motivations to really annoy consumers with their choice of music or the artworks that they use in their in their in their production, right? So there is some market, I think, discipline on uh, that might explain why we haven't uh, experienced in our own lives overgrazing uh, in a way that provides good counterexamples. Uh, that leads us to basement argument, which is really a slippery argument and one that I wanted to actually test <laughs> in, the, in the study we'll talk about uh, in a second. We didn't have enough data points with music. Uh, you would think this debasement argument, this notion that a single or, or a cluster of misuses, of, of, of uh, inappropriate uses of a work would cause its market value to decline, would show up maybe in, in the book market, we see this upward, upward number of editions every year, more editions every year, more popular, and then a sudden plummet. Somebody's, you know, made a porn movie with a story in the book, and now nobody wants to read the book anymore again. I, I don't think that's highly likely, but uh, we didn't have enough data points in the music study to chart that, or really in the book study either. We've got some anecdotes I was talking about at lunch from the Internet Adult Film Database, which is the porn version of IMDb. This crazy person who's charted out tens of thousands of porn movies where the characters are who the stars were. I mean, it's, it's crazy. You can search by character. So I just ran through like Snow White and uh, uh, Cinderella. And, and, and not as many as I thought. It was like five Cinderella movies, three Snow White. There's 27 movie porn movies with Santa Claus as a character. <laughs> and if you um, search any Greek god like Zeus or, uh, or Apollo, you get, there's so many uh, uh, gay porn movies you cannot even possibly count. Um, and so the notion is, I, I, I just, it's anecdotal, but it, it, you know, did, do we really have a sense that these characters are now destroyed, that they have no value anymore in our culture because somebody made a porn movie for them? Probably not. But that kind of an anecdote isn't necessarily going to stop the Disney uh, steamroller in the next legislative session. So there's, there's room to actually do a more serious study and it occurred to me that the market for audiobooks might be a place to look. It occurred to me that this, well, I'm really cheap. I go to this place called LibriVox.org, which has free downloads of public domain books read by volunteers. And some of them are really good, and some are really bad. Um, and it occurred to me, you know, if somebody listened to an audio, a bad recording of an audiobook, would that negatively affect their valuation of the underlying work? They would be less likely to want to, uh, to, want to read the book. And it also, I, uh, looking at the audiobook market, would also give a chance to sort of reconfirm maybe uh, exploitation uh, levels uh, because we could look at you know the percentage of books that have been made into audiobooks. We could also uh, maybe look at pricing data. We could certainly measure the quality of the recordings uh, by using human subjects to evaluate the quality of recordings. And also, hopefully, measure the effect of low-quality recordings on, on value, which would be uh, something uh, quite new in the literature. So. Just looking at uh, exploitation levels, not surprisingly, they mimic what we've already seen with uh, hardcover books and movies. So we looked at the, I took the same set of books that we've already talked about, exactly the same set of books, and just checked to see um, which had audiobook versions and which didn't. So 33% of the public domain titles had audiobook versions, only 16% of the copyrighted titles have audiobook versions. And what's stunning, if you go to just the top 20, the top 20 most popular books of each of those decades, 100% of the public domain titles are audiobooks. Um, only 16 out of the 20 uh, 
have audiobook versions of the copyrighted titles. So we're talking incredibly, incredibly popular books from the golden era of American literature, uh, and you only have an, an 80% uh, uh, audiobook embodiment rate. The pricing data tracks almost exactly what we found with books. If, if you look at the full set, uh, and combine the MP3 and CD format prices, it's $24, right? Because all these audiobooks either come as dig digital downloads or as CDs. It's exactly the same. But if you look at just the top 20, then uh, you have a significant difference. So we do an average price per minute. That's the only fair way to do it because longer audiobooks, regardless of their status, uh, cost more. It costs more to record them. So the price per minute is like 3.8 cents per minute for the public domain CDs, 5 cents a minute for the copyrighted CDs, 2.8 for the public domain MP3s, and 3.6 cents for the copyrighted MP3s. So you, there is a significant difference there. But again, only if you look at that top slice, the most valuable titles in any particular uh, era. So to get to the actual human subject experiment and the questions uh, about uh, recording quality, I call up one of my old a uh, student named Chris Bacabusco is the only person I know who's ever done a human subjects experiment involving copyright law. And I was telling Richard about him at lunch. I'm going to get him to, to, to Washington to talk about some of his data on uh, uh, copyright pricing. But uh, we got together to um, uh, create a human subject experiment so that they could listen to uh, professional versions of the copyrighted books, professional versions of the public domain books, and then free versions of the because for almost all the public domain books, there is a you know, professional version you can buy from Audible.com or Amazon, uh, and then free versions you can get at, at LibriVox. Well, we set up the survey at Qualtrics.com, which is just a terrifically nice service where you can set up your survey online. It crunches data for you, um, makes it very easy to set up a survey format and, and collect uh, data. We got human subjects from the Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk. I don't know how familiar you are with this uh, at all, but Amazon has about 400,000 people who do nothing but online work. And you can post your survey and post parameters of who can take it and who can't. You post a price. And uh, we had 500 subjects uh, paying $5 for about 40 minutes of work, and it took 36 hours to get 500 completed surveys. So, uh, very cheap and easy place to collect subjects because it's not, you know, I'm not sure, well, because I'm interested to see whether a traditional group would behave differently. We just literally today launched a more traditional uh, subject group in the United States using Qualtrics who will actually recruit subjects for you uh, to see whether the data is any different if we're looking at, uh, you know, the more traditional uh, method of, of, of using human subjects, but I'll be surprised if it's, if it's too much different than what we found using so, well, so, so this is just a regular rate that they do above the quality, right? Um, you know, on a scale, Likert scale? Six point Likert scale, yeah. Okay, so, um, because, you know, you and I talked about uh, incentivizing, right? The mood, uh, doing something like, uh, or maybe the beauty complex game, right? When I'm thinking, you're supposed to guess what the other people think about the quality. Right, and you're getting rewarded based on that. Would ah. that give you slightly better um, estimate? Right, I'm just, yeah. That way you incentivize it. This could potentially be also something that you might uh, be able to uh, run through that uh, mechanical turn. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. This this uh, is fun. I should I really should put that there. Uh, uh, Google uh, gave me a grant to do this research, and we have, because it turned out to be cheaper than we thought, we have money left over, so we can actually, we can actually uh, rerun it as a, as a beauty contest. That's actually really, really a good idea. I've given this talk a while, and you're the first person who said that, so that's, um, I'm just obsessed the trip is now, yeah. the trip is now worth it. <laughs> or just <laughs> 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 right. so, uh, Yeah, so the Thank you for that. That's a, that's a tremendous idea. I think we actually asked that sort of question when we get to valuation, but not for quality. You'll see in a second. So, um, so what we want to do is we're, we're, this debasement theory, I think, it needs to be subdivided into two predictions. One is uh, predictions by economists that recordings of public domain books will be of inferior quality because nobody owns them. Nobody will there's nobody to control the quality of the person who's reading it. Therefore, they will be of lower quality. 
And the second claim is that you know, inferior quality will negatively affect the market value of the underlying, of the underlying book. So what we do is we ask, that, you know, we ask a bunch of questions, obviously, and you, in Q&A, you can tease out some of the other ones maybe if you want. This is our six-point Likert scale for the quality of the book. We pretend to uh, be evaluating readers who can do readings for commercial distribution. So I think most of the, uh, the subjects think that we're an audiobook company rating readers. And this is what the Turk is used for. It's really so interesting. So, so uh, advertising agencies will use the, use the mechanical Turk and show you two commercials and then get the human subject responses to the commercials. Or we're thinking of our trademark, using this trademark for this good or that trademark, which do you like better and why. So we appear, we never say it, but we appear to be uh, a commercial audiobook recorder wanting to evaluate people trying out for our services. So the lowest score is this reader could never produce a commercially acceptable audiobook. Uh, number six, this reader was excellent as the highest rating. Five is the reader was very good, clearly read for commercial distribution. That's the, the rating scale on which we rate the readers. This is the best we could do for a question teasing out um, the valuation uh, issue. And I, I, I'm not, I don't think this is the best, but boy, nobody's come up with any competing one. So we asked them, we will have many spare new paperback copies of this book from Recording is concluded. How much should we sell these books for? Keep in mind the average price of new paperbacks in the U.S. is eight to twelve dollars. So that's that's the question we ask to sort of tease out uh, the valuation. We also ask whether would you be interested in seeing a movie made from this book? We haven't crunched that data yet, so I can't tell you what it shows. Yeah, sorry. I, I just want a that kind of open-ended question. I'm going to read about this. I've never done this, but like environmental economics, it's you know. You can say how much do you value, you know, pristine and high country fly fishing experience, or you can say would you be willing, you know, you give a randomized thing of amount, a amount, a binary yes no, and then put like two bucks, five bucks, ten bucks, it's randomized amongst your 500 subjects, and instead of giving them all the same question, maybe you get like a little price response. It's like that last question, it says how much should we sell these books for? So you're, it's an open-ended response. Right. But if you said, um, do you think we should sell these books for? More than five dollars. Yeah, 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 yeah. Across your five hundred subjects, yeah. it, it's a, it, it's just a, yeah. a much more incentive compatible yeah. type mechanism, uh, uh, or you know, or would you buy it if, uh, at five dollars or something like that? You know, it, it, it's a specific price instead of saying open ended. How much would you pay? Mm -hmm. That's all. It's just another. I like the incentive something like a uh, reading and Yeah, you just sort of. It's like, here's, you know, you have been allocated $10 or something. State how much would you be willing to pay? And we just draw a random number, and if the number is higher or lower than you paid for it. Right? It's only a kind of, I can understand that. I mean, well, there's these other mechanisms, but which I remember the last conference I was with Lynn, people were talking about, do people really process that, even though it's, in theory, it's quite good? How do they understand it? But, but either of those ways would be something different and probably yeah. really easy to implement. Yeah, no, you're right, it would. Yeah. And that's that's the beauty of all the parts. I, mean, I, I think that's there has been line. some research now where people were just trying to streamline the procedures, right? Sort of making it simpler. And then it also, you can sort of frame it differently as well. Um, well Ed Carney was at this conference and he had this belief licitation mechanism which we thought was just EDM, and I think it is, and he doesn't think it is. And, and the big criticism was that, well, if you try to run it in the experiments, it's it, people don't really get it the way they should, at least. But anyhow, it, 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 yeah. I think it'd be good to find out the, the simplification of these things because it is kind of a cool little concept. Um, yeah. What's, and what is interesting is that the queuing. We were told we initially had a, a totally open-ended question. We we queue the average price there. That seems to really constrain <coughs> people's responses. I mean, there were very few responses below eight dollars and very few responses above exactly. twelve dollars. Yeah, and whether that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, yeah. All right. So what? What do what do we get here? So um, I think it's 400 subjects. We had to throw out 100 subjects um, because we we uh, I, well there was uh, we had 100 non-native English speakers that we threw out, um, and whether we could have actually prevented them from answering in the first place, I don't know. So we're, these are we're 400 subjects, uh, which gives about 300 observations in each of the, the categories. So not surprisingly, um, you know, the, the LibriVox readers, these are the free volunteer amateur readers, 
uh, have the lowest rating. They're at 3.54. What's interesting um, is that the public domain books written by professionals uh, have a higher average reader rating score than the copyrighted books that are read by uh, professionals and also a slightly higher um, uh, average, uh, average price also. What will they statistically significant? Yeah, so uh, we, they, the numbers have been, been crunched. Um, and let's, and, and I, can, I think I've got that on the next page. Uh, there's no statistically significant difference here. Uh, there is a statistically significant difference, not surprisingly, between professional readers and amateur readers. So professional readers rate more highly um, than amateur readers. Uh, there's no, as far as price goes, there's no statistical significance between the pricing over here. What the, the statistic org is actually kind of interesting. So if we break down, here's just some examples. I hope, hopefully you can, you, you can read them of books in each of these categories. So we have, uh, the top is the LibriVox recordings, the amateur recordings. And what you find is a lot of uh, variation. If you look at the beautiful Madame, this person was the lowest ranked reader uh, of all of the, the 20 LibriVox recordings and had the, uh, one of the highest price ratings. Whereas this person here, read the Magnets and Ambersons, was just beloved uh, by the by the evaluators of his or her reading skills and has a, uh, a price which is actually less than the average price for the, uh, for the liver boxer. So this person was the best reader and had one of the lowest prices. Old Pioneers looks like it correlates pretty well, a bad reader at a bad price. Same thing with Portrait of an Artist. So within each of these categories, you find these sort of anomalies. Same thing here with, with Babbitt. Uh, super high reader rating, but a price that's significantly less than what the average price was. Is there any chance the folks answering this can include how long any of these books are? Because the book I'm reading is about this thing. Yeah, so these, the, the listeners listened to uh, the first five minutes of the fifth chapter of yeah. each but of these books. In the back of my head, yeah, yeah. Okay, we did ask, right, so we asked a number of questions, which I don't have charts for us. Have you read the book before? Do you own the book? Have you ever seen a movie night from the book? Um, and the, the response numbers, there's, there's so few people have ever read any of these books that it, was, that it seems unlikely that that's, right. that that's a fact. Yeah. And the same thing, weird things here. American Tragedy is the lowest rated reader, but they have a well above average price. So the statistical analysis, it has to end up being uh, sort of all of these uh, uh, together. It's rather complicated. And I paid, I hate to say this, but I don't even think maybe I should be happy. Uh, Illinois is a statistical consulting service when you can bring your data to a statistics professor and out of your research budget, you know, their stat center gets paid $50 an hour or, you know, crunch your numbers and make sure and then you get this nice report. And, so uh, I did not personally crunch all these numbers. I would rather pay a PhD in statistics to do it and uh, have them tell me what the results are. One thing we did do before we get the, the actual results is we wanted a control reader because we were worried that you know maybe some of the, the first five minutes of the fifth chapter in some of these books might be really more exciting and more interesting than the first five minutes of the fifth chapter of another book, and that might affect the reader rating, the excitement, you know, the, the attractiveness of the excerpt. So we had uh, we hired this guy named Alex who actually had some professional training in his drama program to read all of the excerpts from all of the books. You know, so in theory he should get you know virtually the same the same rating since he's the same reader, uh, and you know he scores almost exactly the same on the public domain works as on the copyright works. So it doesn't seem to be any sort of attractiveness relative attractiveness factor that affects the. Uh, affects the data at all. And if you look, you know, look at what his score is. He's, he's an amateur reader, 3.83. So if you blend those scores, uh, it's what, like 3.54? I'm going to go back to the, the prior slide. <laughs> the average LibriVox reader was 3.54. So Alex was essentially rated exactly, the, literally to 100th, uh, exactly the same as the typical LibriVox reader. Um, so that was our, our, our control. Before so, I think you're yeah. Just keep going with that. Yeah. I, um, the, um, the the fact that the averages are the same, I don't think is very definitive. I think that you have to have some conditioning information back there. Uh, it, uh, there's a this phenomenon called Simpson's paradox, which is kind of these get averaged out, but uh, 
is because variation in other components, one thing you can completely, you know, one helps you, you can completely good, another, but you've got more wheels than one, and there's interaction terms, something like that. So I just, I, I, the moment I was trying to think of, okay, what can I say that would be the background, and you're, the one that you checked for was maybe an obvious one. Uh, but, uh, yeah, just, I don't know. We checked for also for gender of the reader. Um, and, and that actually turned, there's a statistically significant difference in the, in the valuation, but not in the, uh, not in the evaluation score, which is very interesting. Um, uh, negative, right? Slightly negative on the valuation. Um, but yeah, if you can, if you can think of other, uh, the other, other possible uh, variables that we could Well, I like your idea check. of using Alex yeah. as a, a sophisticated guy who you're paying and presumably he's got some reputational things at stake here to give you reasonable results about boring or, or tedious or exciting or you know, conditioning yeah. factors you could say, well, that uh, seem to be um, about the same in the two, the two groups. Oh, yeah, I'll try to think of other ones that I... I always wasn't scoring them, he was reading them, right? Yeah, who's reading? Yeah. But he, he was, was reading them, but yeah. he was giving uh, this quality evaluation as well, because you said his quality evaluation for the two groups was exactly the same. And what I was thinking is, like, uh, let's take a boring and an exciting, okay? He didn't go back and check for that. And it could be all the old guys, you know, the, the public domain works, you know, they're, uh, or some, I don't know, or, or it could be the 20s. Man, this is so cool, you know, all this stuff, the Chicago, you know, and then the, the copyright, whatever, so there's some kind of thing. And then you say, conditional on being boring, conditional on being exciting, uh, these what things were, but uh, you know, the, the condition on each of those, the, the, the copyright and, and the two scores could be just exactly the same, or or they could be quite different. It could be that you know, for a boring uh, a public domain work and a boring copyright work, there's a different score, and for an exciting one, there's a different score. Yeah. For an average, they work up. I mean, that's the sort of thing I'm thinking of, just to check that background yeah. information. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did not ask the, uh, the stats guy. Do that. And he, it's, uh, it's easy. Yeah, I think you, you've got lots of stuff yeah. in the background you could do with that. Um, mm -hmm. And I could be completely wrong, it's just that mm -hmm. the averages often conceal stuff that's going on in the background. Yeah. If yeah. there's some kind of interaction going on. Yeah. If it wouldn't take so long, I could pick up the raw data and see and eyeball it. But, but yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's, that's super easy to do. Super easy to do. Um, yeah, excellent. That's great. That's great. The other thing I, I as, a, as a listener, when I look at Amazon, I look at the top and the bottom. I've got the five star ratings. It's like, you know, it's one book, 900 ratings, and 800 of them are, are you know, the average is 4.82. There's, there's, you know, 800 of them are, are five star. And there's a couple of bottom ones. And I'll, look at, I'll just look at the extremes. And I think that the, the, I don't know if there's any information in those, in the actual comparing the distributions, but I suspect there'd be some interesting stuff. In, in the, other than just the average. Yeah, well, there is one interesting thing I did not mention, which I got very excited about. It's the, it's the one big mystery in the data. So, so this is, you know, statistically, there's no significance between the two. There is a very, very strongly significant, strong significant difference between the valuations, right? So for the, con I, I can't remember the number exactly in my head, the valuation in, uh, for, for Alex's readings, um, for the copyrighted works is something like nine dollars, and for the public domain works is something like seven and a half dollars. So we've got the same reader, right? So the valuation shouldn't be driven by his voice quality. It should be driven by what? Well, I mean, the first thing popped into my head is that the cop these these twenty copyrighted books or these sixteen copyrighted books are way more famous, it turns out, than those sixteen comparative public domain books. We have partial partial sales data to show that that's it's almost certainly true. So you think, well, these people, even though they don't say they've read the book, they've encountered the book, they've seen it, they know about it, they value it more highly because it's in the cultural consciousness more than the public domain books. Un unfortunate, so I got very excited by that because that would, you know, it's really nice for my data to show these public, these more obscure public domain works of, you know, performing just as well as they're really more famous, stronger copyrighted works. The problem is when you look at, you know, the professional, the professional readers, uh, and the professional readers here, there is there isn't a difference at all in valuation. So the valuation difference only appears with Alex, and not with the professional readers. And I got no theory to explain that. 
that should be the case. You know, the score is aware that the works for copyright or public domain, were they told that or No, and that's the, and, and that's part of the new, the, literally what I, I just sent an email message last night saying, you know, start the survey. We're, the next 500 subjects uh, are going to be told, they're going to know that the public domain works are in the public domain, to right. see whether that affects, whether the knowledge that the work is in the public domain, whether the knowledge that this is a free recording that they can get for free. So it's basically the same survey once they've listened to, the, we put the LibriVox recordings at the end, and then they're told after they hear the LibriVox recording, this was a LibriVox recording, it's free, you can go to LibriVox.org uh, and, and download it as much as you want. Then they get the valuation questions and we're doing this because I have a suspicion that when people know public domain works, when they know it's public domain, when they know it's for free, um, that there should be, you know, that, that you should take that into account when you value it. That usually when people get something for free, they're less critical, or at least that's my, I mean, that's just an instinct. I want to know. I want to know whether, the, precisely, I want to know the answer to the question. Does it matter if these people know that these works are in the public domain or not? I don't know. Um, all right, so almost done. So uh, there's no significant difference between the quality of the public domain and copyrighted audio uh, books. The difference in professional versus amateur does matter. The amateurs definitely score lower. Um, there is uh, a significant positive correlation between the quality of the recording and the perceived value of the underlying book, um, which is interesting and which supports uh, one assertion by the economy but not the second, because there's no correlation, no positive correlation between the amateur status uh, of the reader and the assigned underlying value. I think I pointed that out earlier, that there's, uh, there's no difference uh, as far as underlying uh, valuation goes. So that's what uh, we know so far. Like I said, we're adjusting the survey, and I think we've got some good ideas how to uh, do, the next, do the next round here. Um, this is like my final line of defense of argument, uh, because you know maybe at the end of the day we, we do end up showing decreased market value or something like that. Um, I, I just would argue that debasement could mean one of four things. It could mean decreased market value of the work that's supposedly been debased. It could mean decreased overall public wealth. It could mean our hurt feelings for artists. That, that's why we want to what works to have owners so that artists don't get their feelings hurt when the Christian uh, rocker sees this song in the background of a communist movie or something like that. Um, it could also, there's a theory that uh, we want works to have stable public meanings and we don't want them to be undermined by uh, uh, performances or derivative works that would somehow recode their public meaning. A, gr a great example of this is there was a recently an all-white production of Corgi and Bess in Helsinki, right? uh, which is a copyright violation. The Gershwin estate will not license any performance of Corgi and Bess unless it's an all-white cast. With one white cast member, you will not get licensed because they want to maintain what they think of as the original public meaning of the work. They don't want it undermined. So debasement could mean uh, could be characterized in terms of people who are right. I, I, I mean, that's crazy. I, 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 I haven't I, seen that. But it's like there could be the, the bad guys could be all white too, you know, or something like that. You know? Look, I'm a, I, I believe in a free market for meanings, right? I think we should have competition over the meaning of all of these works, right? I Even if you want to say that there's something important about meaning, you have to have some theory about why public meaning should be a value for things that have been produced recently and not for old things. Like you can debase two thousand year old text, but not the. I'd expect that Christians to get more pissed off about a porn version of the Bible than about something that's being... I didn't check for that. I'm going for like... I, no, there's got to be Adam and Eve. There's got to be... 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 And that's going to be worse on the public meeting side than porn and guests in all white caps. Fair enough. Fair enough. My argument is that, that what we really should care, you care about... Well, I'm saying, even if my data came out very differently, and I, should, and I, I showed that, you know, Listen to a bad audio book. Well, that that, uh, you, that somehow there's a really strong correlation between you know amateurs reading audio books badly and and valuation. Uh, even if you could show that there's this, that this decreased market value for the individual work being studied, that's not the same thing as showing that that overall uh, public wealth has somehow decreased. All it means is that one particular product on the market isn't as popular, and we only worry about that in general, right, in economics, if there isn't 
uh, another product to take its place that's equally good or, uh, or better. We don't mourn the fact that nobody drives, you know, horse, horse buggies anymore. There's no market for buggy whips anymore uh, because automobiles came along. We don't have this notion that just because a particular product in the market uh, is no longer uh, has, has uh, decreased in value, that that that's somehow uh, a war. We only worry when, when overall public wealth is somehow decreased. Uh, I will always have my suspicions that uh, um, we have a, a free and open market for the meanings of these works, or for uh, who's in, in charge of making them available. Uh, that uh, I sort of have my University of Chicago instinct that I'd rather trust trust the market to determine um, what's uh, uh, popular and what's available as opposed to some sort of centralized centralized uh, control over uh, distribution and, and, uh, and production. So. Anyway, that's it. Thank you for coming. I've got, uh, got great questions already, but uh, if anybody has any more, I'd love to hear them. I get a little anecdote about the, uh, the debasement thing with the idea of an audio recording of an existing book. So I'm a big Larry Lessig fan, and Lessig made his free culture book. He has the PDF you can buy it on Amazon, and, and a bunch of amateurs had a reading of it. But there was, I don't know how many chapters, but each chapter is read by somebody different. And so some of them were terrible, just absolutely terrible. Some of them were fantastic. Yeah. But I got so frustrated trying to listen to stuff in the car with these children, and ended up making my own recording, and I bought the book. I got to have the original thing, just that, you know, and it, I mean, it wasn't a PDF, I bought a book as well. Because you made your own book. Yeah, well, I mean, I like, I like listening to, to things. I mean, yeah. but the professional difference, like, uh, yeah. here's the guy, a uh, double, um, uh, I keep forgetting which one did this one, a history of, of DNA. And they've got a professional reader, and the guy is unbelievable. I mean, I paid audio books at 20 bucks, but you only had to listen to the first chapter. It's a long technical book. Really, you know, it's all of these. So I, I wonder, what I wonder is that if there's, a, again, this interaction between high quality reading buying the book. Because that's what convinced me to buy the yeah. book. I, I bought the book as reference on the basis of the, um, the audio book yeah. that was high quality. Right. So what. Um Yes, yeah, so we actually had thought of having um, uh, people at the end. You've heard these excerpts. Do you, would you like us to send you one of these books for free? All right, and we couldn't figure out a way to fit that in our budget, but that would that would be getting at you know the same kind of thing. What we what I'd like to do is do, a, and this would again be longer and more expensive, but it would get at the same question: show people movies, and then afterwards have the book version. I mean, if you, there's a great version, great popular movie version of the book, there's a person more likely, you know, in the lobby afterwards to buy the book. Um, well, every small band, around. that's how they make their money, is they, they do their performance and they go to CDs. Yeah, so. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, were all the books and the readings fictional, were they? Were they all fictional? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they're all fictional. Yeah. Technical books, folks that have diagrams with them, this is the audio version it's all fiction. Um, by the way, Larry, sorry, I just got an email from Larry yesterday. Who I, I sent him the, the Amazon chart. He's really interested. I'm going to put this up in the web so you can send it to him and say, listen, you're listening to the talk. And okay. David Lee in a much better program. You use great sales data at Amazon, right? Uh, all right, it's so game, it would be, yeah, so what you can get on Amazon, right, because you'd like to know, especially in terms yeah. of the comparative, the comparative popularity of the books, is to get the sales data. So you can get, um, we actually did. We, we got sales data. Uh, get it for the copyrighted books is quite easy. Of course, it's just a ranking. Yeah. But but still, uh, you know, it's it's at least some data on how popular the books are. It's easy with copyrighted books because uh, there's usually, there's just one publisher, yeah. right? Uh, when you start looking at the public domain books, you literally have sometimes 30, 40 different publishers. You can't sort yeah. of ag aggregate the <laughs> popularity data. It would be neat to get matched sets of books that one that gets an audio book that put out the other one that doesn't look to see if there is a sales spike that comes up after the audio book comes up. Oh god, yeah. Yeah. And unfortunately that's the other problem with Amazon they don't have this store they don't keep any historical popularity. So you can check the popularity now. 
I but you can't was, you can't like go back a year ago. I thought there's a subscription there. service somewhere in the back that you could get the uh, the old Amazon game. I would check. It, exist, it existed four years ago. I was looking at it for some reason. Doesn't the Internet Archive do that? Who's the guy who oh, said? Oh, it'd be tough to scrape that out. They, no, because every I mean they're they're, they're taking a, they're taking a time slice at every you know I don't know how frequently it is, but my understanding is that they're calling World Wide Web. You can go back and I can find my. I mean I never I, I look. I can't remember the guy's name, but I also wanted to bring, he gave a talk, which I heard, and he, because I think this basement thing is one thing, but the wealth is really where these guys are after. And he had a statistic that said the, something like 80 per 90 percent of the revenue of any published book comes within the first X years, and X is a really small. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And for most books, it's like six months. Yeah. You know, so it's the duration of the thing, which is, if you really want to create incentives, you know, I mean, once you pass a year, you forget about that in terms of, at least, kind of on average. Yeah, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. obviously, you pick up one or two sort of things, so that was just a thought. Um, but I think the Internet Archive, have you, you know? I, I know the Internet Archive, they, they don't, or at least on the stuff that I've seen, they don't, they probably wouldn't have enough same date matches on any book pairs that you want to be looking at to be able to make it nice and comparable. It'd be, it'd be tough. It gives it to your programmer. <laughs> yeah, they also don't. They also don't reveal how they come up with that, with, with the sales ranking. Um, they give you a, this sort of vague hint that it's an average over a particular amount of time. Um, so, I, anyway, I mean, I'd love to. Have uh, Okay, we can't get sales data, but you must. And you can't really sort of tell the difference. You know, something's ranked a hundred thousand, uh, and something else is ranked hundred twenty thousand. Can't really know what whether that's actually a statistically significant difference or not. There's somebody who claims to reverse engineer the algorithm by comparing the data over time. But you can get Google search data, and if there'd be some search term like um, a book title plus five or something like that. Mm -hmm. between a performance and a, and a sort of yeah. application that you want, right? Uh, and again, my, just my intuition of all the music performances is, you know, uh, that's, that's, because the run-of-mill music guy is, uh, rather than just the top guys who are filling the stadiums, that's, they believe, that's what they believe. Yeah, oh, uh, you know, yeah. 100%. Um, but whether it's 